right? It's like you instantly understand each other on some kind of profound level. And I was actually thinking about this earlier today because it's not uncommon to hear people say that they saw Bob Dylan in concert and they thought he was terrible. Right. Um, I've, you know, I've, there are friends of mine who have said that and, you know, I don't try to argue with them, but part of me just thinks, well, there's something about me that you don't understand, <laughs> you know, even though we might connect, you know, on a lot of other issues. But um, the fact that Dylan can provoke such divisive responses to me is an indication that what he's doing is something very, very different as a live performer than what anybody else is doing. And if you're on his wavelength and you get what he's doing, like you do and I do, and many of our, our Bob friends do, then um, you know he, he hits you in a, really, in a really powerful way. Yeah, I have kind of an unusual um, origin story as a Bob fan because the first time I ever heard his voice was when I saw the video for the Traveling Wilbury song, Handle With Care, in 1988. And, um, you know, that song was very different from what you typically heard on MTV at the time. And the style of the video was also very different because it was so simple. It was just four guys standing around a microphone with acoustic guitars singing. And uh, I knew who um, most of the other guys were. I knew who George Harrison was. I knew he was in the Beatles. I knew who Tom Petty was because he was a big MTV star at that point. And I knew who Roy Orbison was because he was in heavy rotation on oldies radio. And my dad was a very big fan of early rock and roll, but my dad was not a Dylan fan. And I never, I never heard Dylan. In 1988, Dylan was not played on oldies radio in Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, that's, it seems kind of strange to say that because now Like a Rolling Stone is in pretty heavy rotation, I think, on all of the oldies stations. But it was almost like at that time, an oldie, like the oldies were 50s rock and roll and early 60s. And there was yeah. kind of a cutoff point of like 1964. Like you could hear the Beatles, but you would hear I want to hold your hand and I saw her standing there. You didn't hear anything after that. And so um, anyway, to make a long story short, um, I bought the cassette tape of Traveling Wilburys Volume 1 and my favorite songs on it were the Dylan songs. And I kind of thought I need to, you know, find out what else this guy has done. So I went out and bought um, Highway 61 Revisited. And the very first time I ever heard Like a Rolling Stone was when I had bought that tape without ever hearing it. And I took it home, played it in my bedroom. And, you know, like Bruce Springsteen said, you know, that opening snare drum is like, it was like the sound of someone kicking open the door to your mind. It was less than a year after I became a fan that I was able to see him live for the first time. And um, that was a really interesting time because it's pre-internet. So I didn't know what the good albums were. You know, today it's like you, if you, you, you're immediately aware of what the critical consensus is of an artist's entire discography. If you look them up online, you look them up on Wikipedia, you know what the conventional wisdom is about what their best work is, what their worst work is. But back then I was just buying albums kind of randomly. And um, I think I had maybe eight or nine albums by the time I saw him. And um, I didn't, you know, I didn't have a lot of the, 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 most famous ones. I definitely did not have Desire. I didn't get that for years later. And uh, I don't think I had John Wesley Harding or, you know, a, but I would all, but at the same time, I had Shot of Love and I had, I had his first album. I had Bob Dylan from 1962. So when I saw, when I saw him in August of 1989, as a 14 year old kid, he played two songs off of his first album and it didn't seem unusual to me. He played Pretty Peggy O wow. and Man of Constant and Man of Constant Sorrow. That's and, great. Know, I was there with my buddy Franklin, who was also 14, and we knew those songs, and we just kind of assumed he did that at every show. <laughs> I, you know, it took a while, but also I probably did have an inkling because that was the first concert I ever saw without parental guidance. You know, I that was the first 
show that I chose to go and see. And I went with a friend my own age and, you know, my dad dropped us off at the venue. So I was already enough of an independent thinker to kind of, um, who have, to have cultivated, you know, a, a certain taste. And um, so it's, it's really kind of not a coincidence, I think, that I would go deeper and deeper uh, into his work over time. But it was really, it probably took about a good decade before it got to the point where I thought, you know, I need to see him as often as possible because these shows are so important. And he's like the American Shakespeare. And, you know, this is like going to the Globe Theater and seeing the premiere of new Shakespeare plays if you lived in Elizabethan England. So it took about a full decade before I got to that point. What, what really happened in 1999 that I think made me become a huge fan was actually seeing two shows on the Paul Simon tour in the summer. Right. Because so that that was the first time I ever saw multiple shows on one tour. You know, prior to that, I had seen about seven shows over the past decade. Um, and then, you know, that's when I first realized, oh, wait, it's a completely different show from night to night because I was, I was reading the set lists online and I was kind of reading reviews of the shows and, and realizing how much he was mixing it up. And then the other thing that happened was noticing that Paul Simon played the exact same show in Chicago that he did in Charlotte, North Carolina. So it's like, you know, the arrangements are the same. He sings them the same. The between song patter that Paul Simon did was the same. He actually I remember him saying in Chicago, Paul Simon told the audience that we all looked so beautiful. And then he said the same thing in Charlotte. And I was like, mad, you know, I yeah. thought- That means nothing you know, now. Yeah, it means nothing. You know, he's saying the same thing every night. So um, that's when I kind of realized that Dylan was a very different kind of performer who just is completely spontaneous. Um, not, not only in terms of, you know, like what songs he's choosing to play from night to night, but also like how he puts them across. Right. He, ne he never sings the same song the same way twice, you know, um, and he's deciding in the moment how he's going to phrase, depending on how he feels that, you know, is he going to stretch out one word? Is he going to throw a pause in here? Is he going to throw a little laugh in here? It's all being decided in the moment. And that to me is the genius of, of Bob Dylan is that spontaneity and that, that dynamic quality that I don't, I've never gotten from another live performer. So, so that was kind of like, okay, I need to see him more often. It, it's hard to explain to people because it's not improvisation. You know, it's not like when you hear about rock performers who improvise, you think of jam bands you know with long instrumental passages where they're noodling around and Dylan's not like that I mean the 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 structure is there but within that structure he's doing so many things that are unique to you know to every performance and that's why you want that's why you go back again and again so anyway beginning in in I think the year 2000 that's when I started traveling so I would I would you know I have friends and family all over the country. And when I would, I would fo follow Dylan's tour schedule and I would, you know, call up people or email them. And I would say, Hey, Dylan is coming to your town. Do you want to go with me? Can I come and crash on your, on your couch? So, um, uh, you know, 2000, 2001, 2002, that was kind of the height of my traveling to see Dylan. You know, I, I, I became friends with Kate Runovich in 2001, co-founder of the, of the Bob Dylan fan club, um, who I know you're also friends with. Like I met her in line in, in 2001. My brother and his girlfriend and I traveled to the last eight shows of the spring tour, which were the last shows before he went into the studio to record Love and Theft. And then I ended up seeing four more shows later in the year, two in the summer and then two in the fall when he was touring off of Love and Theft. And so that to this day, 2001 is the year where I saw the most shows. I saw 12 shows that year. There are a handful of shows that really stand out. And I should also preface this by saying I don't listen to a lot of bootlegs. I don't have bootlegs for most of the shows that I attended. So most of my my you know, opinions about the best shows are kind of based on 
the experience of being there, you know, uh, like how we were talking about Milwaukee earlier. I mean, that to me is one of the best because of, because of circumstances other than what was happening, you know, on stage. Um, although it was a great show, but, um, I would say in 2002, I was at the show in Red Bluff, California, which is a very well-known show. Uh, it was kind of the first show that a lot of people heard from that tour in good quality because it was the first show to start widely circulating. But the show itself was special because it was held in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, like a giant barn. It was a it was a livestock arena with a dirt floor, so it was an it was a it was an indoor venue, but it was like in the middle of nowhere in California. And when I say livestock arena, it's the kind of place where they auction off you know cattle. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, and you're like you know, it's like he was I think between playing in Oregon and Berkeley. So he was like working his way down the coast and he clearly likes to play these weird, you know, out of the way places. And I think the unique quality of that venue really inspired him to give a, a special show. He played um, an incredible version of You're a Big Girl Now, which was, I think, the first time he ever played that on piano. Um, and, you know, just a few other songs. I Shall Be Released, was phenomenal. Um, the, the Warren Zevon covers and so on and so forth. That was a very memorable show. Um, my personal favorite show is probably a show he gave at the Park West in Chicago in 1999, which was the first night of his fall tour. Um, I'm not sure if you were following him then, but Phil Lesh was the opening act of that fall tour. And you know, the fall tours are always the best. But there were only two nights where Phil Lesh did not open for Dylan. Or it may have been a co-headlining tour, but there were only two shows where Dylan did not perform with Phil Lesh. And I was at both of them. It was the first night and the last night. The first night, he did basically two shows in a row at the Park West, which is a small club. It holds about 500 people max. So they were kind of warm-up gigs. And that was my first time being, you know, against the stage. Uh, and I was so close. The stage is low, too. I mean, I could have I could have jumped on it. You know, it went up to about my waist. And so um, being able to see Dylan that close, seeing the blue in his eyes, seeing all of his facial expressions, watching everything the band was doing, uh, you know, whenever you hear a sound, you immediately know where it's coming from. So you, you know how it is. You've it's been hard to ever, time. once you've done that, it's hard to ever go back. It's hard, yeah, it's hard to ever go back because it's, you know, you're, you're a part of the show when you're that close in a way that you're not when you're further back. And of course, you know, he'll look at you if you're in the front row, he'll look into your eyes when he's singing. And it's a kind of nerve wracking experience to be seen by Bob Dylan. Um, but he was also super animated at that show. He high-fived somebody in the front row. I know, Matt, you're a recipient of a Bob Dylan high-five. But to see him do that, uh, and also um, at that time, this is sort of when not everybody was online. You know, uh, I mean, I know Expecting Rain existed and Pagel sites still existed, but it was, you know, people would write down the set list uh, so as to not forget it. And there was somebody next to me who was writing down, every time he would start a song, they would write it down on a piece of paper with a pen. And you can hear this on the bootleg. Dylan says to that person, you writing a check for me? How much, you're, how much are you making it for? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, so that was, uh, you know, prior to this tour, that kind of banter was a little unusual. It started off as a joke. You know, I think Adam and I were joking about going to see another tour and then or going to see another show on the tour. And um, and then the joke just kind of became a reality. I think part of it has to do with the fact that he did change the set list and he did change some of the arrangements. So I really wanted to feel like I got a sense of how the tour evolved. And there's no better way to do that than to see the first show and to see the last show. And so I think between the three that I saw, I got a very, very good sense of 
what the Rough and Rowdy Ways Worldwide Tour is all about. The first leg, anyway. Uh, the Milwaukee show was probably, it, it had an atmosphere of anticipation and excitement that I've never experienced in any of the 77 shows that I've been to. So that made it very, very, very special um, because it was the first show after this hiatus. Um, and then, of course, it was also the first show after Rough and Rowdy Ways. Those are kind of two separate things that were, were going on there. And, you know, you know how it was. You were there and we were all kind of wondering who's going to be in the band. You know, what is Dylan going to sound like? What are, you know, um, what songs is he going to play? Yeah, what does Rough um, and Rowdy Ways tour mean? Does that mean he's going to sprinkle in two or three songs? I mean, I don't right. think anybody thought he was going to play eight of them. Well, we, we drove up from Chicago and I asked point blank everybody in the car. I, we, Ray Padgett was also riding with us. And I said, how many songs do you think he's going to play off Rough and Rowdy? And without missing a beat, Adam and Ray both said at the exact same time, three. So, which I think is, you know, kind of a logical guess. And then the fact that we got eight was just more than what we could have dreamed of. So it was it was mind blowing. But then on top of that, you had all these other, you know, there was so much going on. It was like, wait, who is that new guitarist? We were looking at Doug Lancio trying to identify him. We were watching the new drummer. We were, um, you know, uh, just so much was going on. And then of course, the fact that Dylan was singing so beautifully, I will never forget hearing him sing, I've made up my mind to give myself to you. And just being in awe of, how amazing his voice was the way it 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 swooped and soared and the way he elongated those words um you know we all agreed it was a better vocal performance than than what is on the album so it exceeded expectations but you know it's funny seeing the show last night in dc you know the show last night was better i mean it was it's tough to compare because the atmosphere was very different. There wasn't that what the hell is going to happen factor, but the band is more confident now uh, after having 21 shows under their belt. So the band was tighter. And I think the guitar players in particular really knew exactly what to do in a way that they didn't on opening night. At the end of the day, Dylan's vocals are the most important thing i yes. mean you know we all want we all want exciting set lists we want rare gems to be performed but you know what you really want are emotive vocals where you feel like he's a hundred percent committed and that's what we're getting on this tour to a degree that i i, I think you'd have to go back to 2002 to really feel the passion in his singing. And I'm not one of those people who thinks that, you know, the years where he was doing a lot more growling and barking is like some dark period in his career. I think, you know, I've never seen a Dylan show that I would say is bad. Um, even the worst Dylan show I saw was still pretty damn good. Um, but yeah, the singing on this tour, it's, it's undeniable. It's, you know, there are people who are seeing shows on this tour who, who, who had written Dylan off, who are uh, all of a sudden reevaluating, you know, what they previously thought. And that's, you know, it's pretty damn gratifying. And I think Rough and Rowdy Ways has a lot to do with it. He's very confident in this material, obviously. And I think he's uh, justifiably very proud of these songs. A lot of people think that I'm being perverse or that I'm trying to drop a hot take when I say that, but I really, um, I, I, I think I may have listened to that album more than any other, just in the year and a half that it's, it's uh, been, been out. And part of the reason is because, of course, of the pandemic. Um, I, you know, like a lot of Dylan fans, I had a lot of time on my hands. <laughs> I was working from home, you know, when the album was released. And um, in a way, it was a bit like when Love and Theft came out, you know, in the aftermath of 9-11, I listened to that album obsessively. And um, it, it, you know, Rough and Rowdy Ways, to me, how I feel about it is kind of inex 
is kind of inextricable from the historical moment in which it was released. It's an album that brought me a lot of comfort. And I started a new routine, which is that I, um, I used to go to a gym before the pandemic and then the gym closed. So I started walking five miles every day. There's a cemetery, uh, which is two and a half miles from my home. So every day, and it's on the same street where I live. So every day I just walk straight down Glenwood Avenue till I reach St. Boniface Cemetery. I touch the cemetery wall and then I turn around and I walk two and a half miles back. And it takes about an hour and 10 minutes to do that, which is, you know, enough time to listen to all of Rough and Rowdy Ways. So I literally listen to the album in full every day, at least once all the way through. And then would oftentimes, uh, especially in those early months, would listen to it, you know, in addition to going on those walks. And so I spent a lot of time doing nothing but just listening to it. And this is something I don't really do with music these days. I mean, when I was a kid growing up in the 80s and 90s, uh, pre-social media, I would buy an album, sometimes on cassette tapes, you know, and then sometimes on vinyl and then later on CD. And I would listen to it in my room, lie in bed and stare at the ceiling and just listen to the music. And now, of course, um, you know, with the insanity of modern life where you're just being bombarded with information everywhere, I'll listen to music around the house, but I'm always doing other things. And so, um, you know, the pandemic forced a lot of us to slow down. And just being able to go on this walk and listen to these songs, I got very, very, very deep into this album in a way that I would have eventually, because I think the material is profound. I think Rough and Rowdy Ways is, is really the ultimate con Bob Dylan concept album. Um, but I think I grasped that more quickly because of how much attention I was able to pay to it, you know, in the weeks and months following its release. Well, I think, um, you know, you could argue that a lot of Dylan albums are concept albums. You know, a lot of people have tagged uh, Blood on the Tracks, you know, the divorce album and so on and so forth. But I think Rough and Rowdy Ways to me is, is, perhaps his most autobiographical album, not in the way that um, people think of songs like Sarah as being autobiographical, where he's addressing an individual, but in the sense that to me, the whole album, every single song is about what it means for Bob Dylan to be an artist. And um, I think, you know, it's, it, the, the album is structured almost like a two act play. And Murder Most Foul, in my opinion, is the entire second act. You know, I, I'm sure you saw on Expecting Rain on the forums, there was a whole debate, which I thought was very silly about, you know, is Murder Most Foul even part of the album or is it a bonus track? <laughs> which I thought was crazy that people would think that. Um, that. That to me would only make sense if there was a version of the album available without Murder Most Foul on it, but right. you can't not you can't buy it that way. Um, but I understand why I do understand why people thought that because it is it is kind of segregated onto a second disc. But to me, rather than that being Dylan sort of trying to de-emphasize that song uh, or to separate it, to me that was his way of putting a spotlight on it, saying this song is so important that if you're listening on CD. You know, you're going to have to change discs and you're going to have to mentally prepare for this epic song, uh, which is the conclusion of this album. So um, to me, the first nine songs are all, in a way, roads that lead to Murder Most Foul, because the whole song Murder Most Foul is about, you know, uh, the, of course, the assassination of, of John F. Kennedy, but more importantly, it's about how people turn to art and how they turn to music specifically right. in time 
in times of trauma. And so Dylan is putting himself in that lineage of all of these other artists that he's name checking in the song. And so, um, you know, in a way, every one of the preceding nine songs can be seen as uh, relating to Murder Most Foul in some way. I don't think that album would have turned out the way that it had if not for him winning the Nobel Prize in Literature. Um, most obviously, I, you know, the song Mother of Muses, is, I think, was inspired by his having won it and the inscription that's on the back of the medal. Um, he, he kind of alludes to it in the lyrics to that song. But more importantly, the album is so big. It's such a bold album. It's so ambitious. There are so, you know, he references history in it over and over and over again, um, especially historical tragedy. You know, there's kind of this sense of cycles of history, history repeating itself. Um, the function of artists throughout the ages, you know, going all the way back to classical antiquity. And, um, you know, I think it's funny before Chicago, uh, I was talking to Ross Berman. I don't, I, he actually said this when we were having pizza. I don't know if you heard him. He said he thought that Tempest was supposed to be Dylan's last album. And that when he won the Nobel, Dylan probably said, damn, you know, now I have to do another one. And I said, my response was, yeah, but that's what's great about it because he's basically saying, oh yeah, well, remember how I won the Nobel Prize in Literature? This is why. <laughs> So it's, you know, it's like a swinging for the fences kind of album, you know, uh, behind us, there was a family of four, there's a husband and wife and their two college age daughters, and they were seeing Bob for the first time and um, the, the, the mother asked me, have you seen him before I said yeah this is my 75th show, and she was couldn't believe it she said 75 <laughs> times I said yeah. And she said, well, when was the last time you saw him? And I said, 2019. And she had this worried look on her face. And she said, how was he? And I said, he was fantastic. I said, did you, uh, I said, have you heard Rough and Rowdy Ways? Because I, I kind of thought if, if she had heard that album, that would be a good indication of what to expect from the show. But she said, her response was, he has a new album. Uh -oh. <laughs> so it was clear this entire family who were paying, you know, $125 a seat for these, you know, for the good seats were really only familiar with the early stuff. But the point I want to make is after Mother of Muses, the father tapped, uh, I think, I don't know if it was Adam or Ray on the shoulder and said, how old is that song? And whether it was Adam or Ray, they responded, oh, it came out last year. And I could just tell that by the way he asked the question, he was really impressed by right. the song. He wanted to know, you know, when it was from. So that is what's really exciting is, is seeing how well the new songs are going over, you know, with casual fans and hardcore fans alike. I mean, the thing that grabbed me about Dylan initially was the sound of his voice. And I think, you know, I have, you know, of course he's the greatest songwriter of all time, but I really, I think I'm more interested in him as a singer than I am as a songwriter. You know, that's the quality that keeps me going back. A, he's a singer and a live performer and he always has been. So when people say, oh, Dylan's a great songwriter, but a terrible singer, I, I never, talk to, I never try and argue with those people I just say well yeah he's not for all tastes and I think to myself hopefully someday you'll get it but I'm not going to be the one who tries to change your mind um and uh you know what I'm really talking about I think is it's Dylan's artistic integrity you know um as a singer the inability for him to be fake the inability of him to go through the motions as a performer. Um, it's almost like, you know, and of course this extends to the choice of material he's gonna play. It's been pointed out. He is the only 80 year old performer who has a new album that comprises half of his set list. 
at least at that level of fame, nobody else can do that who is from that generation, which is amazing, you know? Um, you know, you know, there are other performers I like, you know, not even Neil Young, who I think maybe comes the closest to being a Bob Dylan like figure in terms of his relentless touring and how prolific he is in putting out new material. You're not going to see Neil Young play eight songs off of his new album when you go see him live. Nobody else can do it. Their fans wouldn't let them. And it's almost like Dylan has sort of gotten to this point where, yeah, there's always going to be those people who show up expecting him to be playing an acoustic guitar and singing blowing in the wind and the times they are changing how these people still exist i find you know i i don't understand um how they're unaware of the fact that he's changed over time but he's really throwing down the gauntlet and saying look i'm a different kind of performer now and if you want to come along with me you want to see me live you know you have to be familiar with what I've been doing for the past 10 years. He marches to the beat of his own drum to an extent that nobody, that no major American artist does. You know, it's like he's not afraid to alienate uh, his fans. He's not afraid of being misunderstood. He does what he wants to do. And I, as an artist myself, I find that incredibly inspirational because you know, I hope to be creating when I'm 80 years old <laughs> and I want to have that same degree of integrity. <laughs>